Good evening. Uh, today I'm going to interview Bernie Taylor. He is an independent naturalist and author whose research explores the mythological connections and biological knowledge among prehistoric, indigenous, and ancient peoples. His work in these areas include Biological Time, 2004, and Before Orion, Finding the Face of the Hero, 2017. Before Orion is premised on Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey monomyth that is at the core of stories worldwide among indigenous people, the ancients, and our modern society. Before Orion explores a deeper route for this monomyth by looking at how hunter-gatherers viewed themselves within the natural and spiritual worlds through Paleolithic cave art from 40,000 years ago. Taylor proposes that select cave paintings are fundamental pieces in the human journey to self-realization, the foundation of written language, and a record of biological knowledge that irrevocably impacted some of the artistic styles, religious practices, and stories that are still with us. Okay, so Bernie, welcome. Um, why don't you go ahead and tell me why you wrote to me first? And Absolutely. Well, Skip, for, thank you for having me on your podcast, YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. How did I come to you is almost how did I come into this, this concept of before Ryan, the book and the hero's journey and so forth is I completely stumbled into it. Um, I was not a reader of young. I was not a believer in Joseph Campbell. I was interested in animals. Mm -hmm. I was interested in the, the biological clocks of animals. So I live in the Pacific Northwest and we have salmon. Salmon run earlier, later, one year, the next. But the all, all the species of salmon run earlier, later, together. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so the concept, you know, there's a lot of ideas about that. And I worked with Oregon Fish and Wildlife and we developed a hypothesis and how to actually you, time the You salmon. developed a what? Hypothesis. Uh, hypothesis. Um, we tested okay. the hypothesis mm -hmm. and how the, how the salmon are timed. And I gave presentations to fish and wildlife agencies, the federal, state, um, academic conferences, power people, and the tribes in the Pacific Northwest. And when, when you go to the tribes and you speak, speak before the tribal counselors and, and speak in the schools, you gain a different understanding of the history of mankind. And mm -hmm. Young himself um, had visited tribes in the United States. And he started to realize that there were concepts that people were having in dreams were also expressed through the myths and stories of Native Americans. Therefore, there must be some common, uh, um, common commonality, whether it be collective unconscious or something else that's bringing this together. So someone said to me, well, you have the tribes have the same timing mechanisms in their calendars and their traditions in their mythology. And if they're hunter-gatherers by nature and they're animus, perhaps it might go, go deeper in time. And the person said to me, you should look at the cave art in Europe. At that time, the, the dating of the cave art was not as good as it is today. And old was 17,000 years ago, let me tell you. And it was at Lascaux. I looked at the cave image at Lascaux, and based on some anthropological work that had previously been done by a fellow named Alexander Marshak, uh, Roots of a Civilization, Huge book, about probably three inches thick, tabletop book. The, 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 the clocks and timing of the animals on, under my study were exactly the same as depicted on the cables, which makes complete sense because the animals haven't changed. Right. All makes sense. Okay. And so there's, it's, and when I did that, that was probably about 14 years ago, and I was pretty far out there in the biological world. Um, and, and how I did this, and now it's all mainstream, and people use it as part of sort of procedures um, in how they manage fish and wildlife. Mm -hmm. But it was at the time I was, um, it was it was like voodoo. I'm going to tell you, <laughs> but but it, sure. it, it all worked out. It was a little statistically done, and I was a, I was a numbers person at that time, so it was all about the math. And so I did this work, and I wrote before um, biological time. That was about 13 years ago, and I said I'm going to put this on 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 the shelf for a few years, I'm gonna come back when there's more information and I could re, you know, take it a step further. And I came back about 10, 10 years later 
And at that time, there's a new dating of cave art, a new way that it was done. And it pushed back some images to 40,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that, so we're, we're pushing the boundaries of what we had previously thought humans could even do. Because um, in the time of Marshak in the 19, let's say, 80s, they didn't believe people could count. Okay. Yeah. The time of when Picasso walked into Altamira Cave over a hundred over a hundred years ago, they said everything was a fraud. And Picasso came out and said none of us could have done anything like this. We could not have been the perpetrators of this fraud. <laughs> and so, forty thousand years ago is really important because now we're pushing the the limits of we, what we thought humanity was. And if young, if young today was alive, um, and and Freud as well they wouldn't have been looking at, at ancient Egypt as they did and looking at the Epic of Gilgamesh for 40, 4,500 years ago, which were the defining archeological records of their time. They would have been looking at what was 40,000 years ago. Actually, they would be looking at what was 50,000 years ago. What was 50,000 years, exactly, 50,000, exactly, that, that is true. In fact, I'm looking, I'm looking 300, just to let you know, but in terms of this context, this you, conversation. You're looking 300 what? 300,000 years ago. That's my interest. Okay. I'm going to tell you about something that's 140 million years ago, but let me just give you a cave drawing from 50,000 years ago, uh, just for sharing. Okay, this is, this is uh, a mandala that mm -hmm. is in a cave in Kimberley, Australia, and it was 50,000 years ago. And Dr. Young was very interested in mandalas throughout his uh, career uh, from the Red Book time. But in his lifetime, the earliest mandala known was one that was 35,000 years mm -hmm. ago. But recently, this one uh, was found at 50,000 years BCE uh, in Kimberley, Australia, just for your information. Sure, and that's their new dating techniques. So we're, we're the the images that I'm talking about are not mandalas. And they're, we, can, we can say that we could hypothesize that that's a mandala, right? It could be something else. It could be a, a, time, it could be a dating a calendar, for example. Um, well, but cal calendar in those days was a mandala also. Exactly. Okay, I agree with that. Okay. Okay. What we found in these cave, well, going back to these cave images to, let's say, 34 to 40,000 years ago, we actually found characters in the story. Mm -hmm. And that's what differentiates the two. And if you go to, if you listen to, if you go to a um, um, pretty much any humanities or social science class that explores the human mind, they start at Gilgamesh. I mean, Gilgamesh, because Gilgamesh had fundamentally the same problems that we have today. He was, you know, he's hashtag me too, you know, the whole thing. And um, yeah. Gilgamesh had, and so we say we're psychologically the same as we were 4,500 years ago. Surely. So I'm pushing it back 30,000 years ago earlier and showing that we have a story. We have a story in this, this cave called the El Castillo Cave in the northern part of Spain, Cantabria, mm -hmm. on the Gallery of Discs. And you can show, after you can show the audience, the, you can insert the video for the, the fighting the face of the hero at this point um, afterwards. Yeah, uh, right. And but you're going to have to send me that. I'll send that to you. Yes. Okay. What sure. I can do is I can, I can show it here just as a marker at the okay. moment, just to make sure that we have the right one. So here is your first video that was on YouTube. This is the one you're talking about. Correct. Okay. Tell me about that. So in this video, we talk. We talk about a character, uh, in fact, two characters. This one, we have a teacher speaking to the ear of the apprentice. Okay? We have an older gentleman and a younger boy. And the younger boy has wide red eyes. You can see his flaring nostrils and his lips are, are pursed. And the teacher has that larger nose and he has that, that brown hair of sorts. Um, and he speaks into the ear. He's telling him something, maybe a story, maybe instructions, maybe a myth. We don't fully know just by this image alone. Right. But as we go through the slides on this, we find that this, this story is of a journey. It's of a hero's journey of mm -hmm. a character that travels from the northern part of Spain, across the, the, down the Iberian Peninsula, across the Strait of Gibraltar into Western North Africa. And we can tell that 
based on the animals in the image. Joseph Campbell spoke of a monomyth he called the hero's journey. With archetypal characters Carl Jung believed are stored deep in the cave of our minds. This monomyth may await our rediscovery in the Spanish cave of El Castillo from 34,000 years ago. Where a teacher shared a story with an apprentice about a novice who begins his journey near to midsummer when golden eagles fledge. Our novice leaps forward with the strength and determination of a lead mare, cunningly navigates past a giant crab on the seashore, and rests on a rock in the twilight with a plump seal. He enters the salt water and with great endurance swims into the night guided by a dolphin that acrobatically spins above the surf. The novice reaches a foreign shore where a mother giraffe protects her young with natural camouflage, and the lioness stays her head lower than the king. The boy safely drinks from a river alongside an elephant, while a great scaled creature with huge sharp teeth lurks upriver in the shadows near to a bathing young red-haired woman who finds herself cornered by the creature. The elephant abruptly lifts its ears and trunk to alert the boy. There, in a moment of crisis, the novice rises to battle his fears, the true monster that lurks within us all. With his newfound courage, he scares off the great creature, rescues the damsel in distress, and becomes a great hero. Our hero returns home to share his story of love and adventure with a new apprentice. In the monomyth, we discovered on the wall of a Paleolithic cave brought forth from our minds and that speaks to the hero within us all. In the cave, I discovered remains of a primitive culture, that is, the world of primitive man within myself, before Orion. Okay. okay, so on, we have a journey from a, of a character who travels from the northern part of Spain, Cantabria, down the Iberian Peninsula, what is now Spain, across the Strait of Gibraltar, and into West North Africa. And we can tell this based on the animals and the environment. So mm -hmm. in, the, in the Spanish environment, we have the horse. And the unique animal in the African art environment was the giraffe. Mm -hmm. And it continues to be the giraffe outside mm -hmm. of any. And in the middle, we have marine animals. We have a dolphin. We have a whale. Um, we have a crab and um, one or two other marine animals. It's a, a great auk, the now extinct great auk was a marine bird. Right. And so he goes, he, he travels from the north to south and back again. And as he, he goes on his journey, he encounters animals. And he doesn't, he doesn't kill the animals. He doesn't tame the animals. The character integrates with the animals. He draws strength from the animals in the same way as we would do perhaps in our movies with Batman and Spider-Man and Ant-Man, the new heroes of our time, at least the new animated or mystical, mythical heroes of our time. Right. And so it's an animist concept that also Jung and Joseph Campbell and others found among Native Americans that they related back to European man in their time to start working out the hypothesis. And they, they, they call this primitive man. Um, which we or which we don't a word we don't use today. We will use Paleolithic for the time period. Um, okay. So we have we have this character north to south goes in the hero's journey, integrates with these animals, and what's very unique about all these animals is most actually most of them are female. <laughs> and he the character becomes a, the, the hero becomes a juvenile or protected juvenile to the mother female. Hmm. And the, the character is, is other, there's only one female character as a human character in the whole panel where there's 30 or 40 um, animals and human characters, um, male characters. Mm -hmm. And so the, the Pelotic artists saw that the strength in the, in the natural world was among the females. Mm -hmm. And that's where you learn to, that's where you go for, to pr protection. But you have, to, you have to leave each female on that journey to gain your own strength. Right. And so that was, that's important. And that's, that's something that perhaps Jung would have said. Now, Joseph Campbell hypothesized that there was a hero's journey. And he said there was a, a core monument that people around the world tell. 
And he said that it could come from two places. One is so far deep back in time that we don't remember it, or there's some sort of hyper uh, diffusion of the myth in more recent times. And Joseph Campbell had read literature in the caves, and he hypothesized that there's some, some areas of caves are all female characters, others are all male, and that this is some sort of organization that's not at random. And he said that, well, this is the myth. Well, that doesn't make the myth. You gotta have, you know, you have a story. You have to have something yeah. identical that, that jumps out at you. Right. Um, and in this, and what, um, one of the, the let's say the, the phrases that people in Jungian and Joseph Campbell say is that, in circles, is that when the archetype is encountered, the story is evoked. Right. It's a common okay. phrase people use. I'm not, I, I'm not sure if I can credit to either one of those. Well, but it's, it's, it, we, we say it's constellated. Okay. Ar okay. Archetype, archetype is constellated. Exactly, it's constantly. And so as we, what we find in this panel is we have this, this, this character, this hero goes on this journey. And he, so he becomes the archetypal hero. Mm -hmm. um, and he encounters the, the protector characters who in, let's say, modern movies would be a shaman, you know, a Gandalf or, a, um, you know, whoever it is in Harry Potter series, all the, the many characters that help Harry. Mm -hmm. And many of those, those characters in the Harry Potter series also turn into animals. They have animal spirits guiding them. Mm -hmm. And so we have this character, we have the archetypal character who goes on his journey and he has archetypal spiritual helpers. And he goes across, you know, tremendous, you know, areas of land and sea and, and, and so forth. And if we, can you imagine today, you, you have a military background. If you were to tell someone in your command to travel from the northern part of the Iberian Peninsula of Spain, that they need to walk on foot, swim across Strait of Gibraltar, into, deep into, actually 100, 100 to 100 miles into Africa, and then come back again. And that was your command. What do you think the response would have been? Well, if they have to walk, <laughs> they might ob object today, but... <laughs> because that truly would be... That would a be a huge, a huge trip, obviously. It would be a huge trip. With it, without, having, without having the mechanization that we currently have. <laughs> in our current time. So this is really like the, the ultimate journey. And this person has traveled, we can see in the images, he has a club, you know, he encounters lions and crocodiles and, you know, what we would consider to be ferocious beasts of our time that we yeah. perhaps wouldn't want to encounter without um, a gun or a knife or, um, you know, a team of people helping us. Yeah, actually, if, we, if it's got crocodiles in it, it's probably true that he went much farther than a hundred miles into Africa. Well, interesting. So they, if you travel into the northern northern Sahara today, mm -hmm. um, you could you could walk for days into the desert and you'll see hippopotamus and crocodiles mm -hmm. and, and giraffes, because the Sahara, prior to seven six seven thousand years ago, was actually had large lakes, lakes as large as the Great Lakes. Sure. And so it would have been the northern part of the Sahara. He didn't have to go too far deep into it. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. And so right. At, so a, at a different time. At 40,000 years ago, you're probably right. And you had some very large lakes. And people still, um, I don't want to say the word is mine, but they, um, they take water from those lakes that have, are now deep within the desert. Yeah. And that's, that's how they, they, feed, they bring water to the big cities. Yep. And so we have, so we have the, these archetypal characters. So now we're saying to ourselves, we have a story of a hero's journey mm -hmm. that roughly approximates those that we find in modern times, especially that the Greeks have told. Yeah. We, have, we actually have many of the Greek characters. We have a man who overlaps with a horse to become a... Like Pegasus. What you, man overlaps with a horse. They become one. What is that? Pegasus. Centaur. A centaur, centaur. Yeah. He becomes a centaur. We have a man who overlaps with a who, who overlaps with a, an eagle to become an avianoid or a bird man, which is a, a common theme metaphor that we find around the world. And in that metaphor, the bird man around the world, it's typically associated with transcendence. Mm -hmm. Okay, so especially among Native Americans, which of course Young found on, on his travels to the United States. Right. And so, so here's the question for you, Skip is. How do people all around the world, have, and deep into 40, 30 to 40,000 years ago, have these, these um, images of transcendence through the Birdman? 
Okay, they have them because these images actually go back three and a half billion years. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, and what from a Jungian point of view, we we would talk about the self, which Dr. Jung sometimes referred to as the two million year old man, but mm -hmm. in his time, we weren't really thinking about the fact that life began at, at single celled organisms, right? Mm -hmm. And so in all of us are uh, archetypal images that date back to single celled organisms and mm -hmm. all of our ancestors for every single human being that's alive today, all of our ancestors did two things correctly. They survived until they reproduced. Mm -hmm. They had to do those two things 100% perfectly or you wouldn't be here and I wouldn't be here, mm -hmm. right? And so the two million year old man or the, the self, this three and a half billion year old man actually, um, has developed all kinds of ways of survival uh, from that time. Um, and, um, and so one of these is images and, and I can document images as far back as 200 million years. And I happen to have it on my desktop. So I'll, I'm going to share it with you right now. So in the 1990s, um, divers in Japan were finding mandalas. Mm -hmm. And this is the image that I have of it, uh, or one image that I have of it. Now um, a fish does that. Yes. We've seen that, yeah. Right, the fugu fish does that, the, the puffer, the so-called puffer fish. Mm -hmm. And so I have a picture of that as well, uh, which I will share with you now. And, um, but the significance of this is that it's a perfect mandala. Mm -hmm. And just as, um, you know, you have the rose window in Notre Dame, uh, and you have the mandalas on the cave ceiling in, in um, uh, Kimberley. But in this case, human beings separated from this creature uh, at least 200 million years mm -hmm. ago. Okay. Now, I can, I, can, I can tell you a story about me, and it relates to the Pacific Northwest. I actually have some experience with salmon because um, when I was a little boy, uh, ages five to seven, I guess, um, I lived in Kodiak. My, my father was a naval officer, and he was stationed in Kodiak. And so a couple of seasons, we saw the salmon run. And so I remember as a, as a little boy being in the stream and, and literally guys, Navy sailors were going out in these streams with baseball bats and simply pounding <laughs> the salmon, and, you know, just randomly. And the, they, would, they would get one or two and that would be their fishing. They never mm -hmm. used never used a hook. Mm -hmm. um, but while I was in Kodiak, and uh, mind you that <clears throat> today it's very common for little kids to have um, toy dinosaurs, but it was not very common um, when I was 68 years ago, so seven, more, almost seven decades ago. And so at the time that I lived in Kodiak, I had never seen a dinosaur, mm -hmm. okay? I'd never seen one. And I'd never talked about one. I was five years old, never even thought about it, right? But one evening, my parents took me to the movies at, to see a you know, movie they wanted to see, which was a black and white film. And it was an early version of Jurassic Park. Mm -hmm. And in that film, the scary creature was actually a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Okay, that's what the, what the creature was in that movie. But within the next day or two, that movie constellated in me images 
that had to come to, to me from something like 140 million years ago mm -hmm. because I had a dream where I looked out my window. Now this is the land of the rising sun, right? So, <laughs> so it's 11 o'clock at night and it's light outside. And I could look out my window in my dream and I saw, I don't know what kind of dinosaur it is, but it's a dinosaur that has a very, very long neck and it eats the tops of brontosaurus. trees. Brontosaurus. What is it? I think it's a brontosaurus. Brontosaurus, okay. So I've okay. never seen a brontosaurus. I never mm -hmm. had a brontosaurus introduced to me mm -hmm. in my lifetime. I never had seen the image, but I had a dream of that mm -hmm. that night. That image from that dream had to have come from a time when those actually existed. Mm -hmm. And the ancestor was one of these very little mammals that survived the, the dinosaur age mm -hmm. uh, and passed that image, however, through the DNA or whatever, down to me. The good now, question, whatever, that's the question, isn't it? Right, and the point is that today, um, I, I think that all, little children have these uh, dream of these things or envision these things and that the reason the dinosaur toy market is so popular today is because it's a way for parents to say you don't have to worry about this mm -hmm. it's not it's not real it's just this little toy thing don't worry mm -hmm. right and uh, so archetypally I have to say that the reason those toys are successful Mm -hmm. is because of of the fact that those images are in kids mm -hmm. and they do regularly scare them that's i mean this is a hypothesis of mine but mm -hmm. ca carry on go ahead so everything you just said in the last 10 minutes is complete heresy in scientific circles of course absolutely everything right that doesn't mean i don't believe you but it's right. considered heresy so what i've i i float in <laughs> Jungian circles, and I float in archaeological, anthropology, biology, cosmology, as in like astrophysics types. And I'm looking for how can this be explained in a way that's, or whatever, because that doesn't work. Cause it, that, and so this is how I, yeah. I'm approaching it. And very similar to, your, to the, the fish you have, is that I live in Portland, Oregon, just outside of Portland, and we have sure. a zoo. And if you don't like zoos, you're not going to like this zoo. But if you're okay with zoos and you don't have, you know, $100,000 to go visit Africa, you know, you'll like it. Okay. Mm -hmm. But in this zoo, we have a lion area. And then the lion area at the top, there is always the male lion at the top of this heap. And if he's not the type of heap, he's in a corner, his own little cave on the side. And below the, if, he's, if they're on the heap and he's at the top, the females are just below him. And at the bottom is a juvenile male. Mm -hmm. It's always that way. And I've gone to the zoo so many times, it's it just, and if you can, you can Google pictures of the Oregon Zoo lions and you'll just see pictures of the exact same thing. Right. So, so none, of these, none of these lions have ever been in the wild and it's been generations since they've been there, but they have the same structure. And in the, it works in the wild because the male dominant lion at the top, he's protecting the territory from other lions who, if they come in and they kill him, they kill all his offspring and they take over his pride. Right. Whereas, and that's why the feet among lions, fem the lionesses do all the hunting so that he doesn't get accidentally harmed so he can continue protecting the tribe. And the juvenile male is at the bottom, so he's the apprentice of sorts, and the women are pushing him down, and he's just not right to be at the top. <laughs> it's, it's the Lion King, right? It's the Lion King. Right, right, right. So how could this come to be if lions, if these lions have not had been in the wild for generations and no one taught them to do it and they're being fed and there's no other male lion come in to challenge the territory. Mm -hmm. So here's a hypothesis. So the, the male lion is just raging in testosterone because that's what big male lions do. And he push and he has the strength and he, he puts a fear of sorts into the female lions. And so they're a step down from him. Okay. And then the women push down the women push down the, the, the lion cub or the, the ju juvenile male mm -hmm. as part of their natural order too. Right. Now none of this and it, 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 this entirely can be biochemical. None of it has to be through memory itself. Right. Okay. And that's really important. So we can explain some of these things 
through the biochemistry as opposed to a collective unconscious, which I'm not opposed to. Now, if we put this into a story, okay, we have the, the hero is, or the, 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 the conquered hero, conquered hero is the, the lion at the top, the male who protects the bride. Right. And if another lion comes to challenge him, that becomes the stranger who enters the room. Okay. okay? But at one point, that lion at the top of the heap, he was once the stranger that entered the room, but now he's the hero. Yeah. Okay. So there's a, there's a slide we can pop up now, the one that's titled Stranger, and I'll read it off. Go. Okay. So I'll read it. The one, us, me, and the other is in the nature of all beings. Together they form the basic storylines of the anxiety-consumed hero who is reluctant to answer the call and the equally anxious stranger on the other side of the door who are one and the same. Right. And so we can tie this back to the lion because the lion who comes to challenge, he's anxious. Sure. Right? And that, ju that juvenile lion at the bottom of the pack, you know, he, he is the, he's the hero who hasn't even taken his journey yet. Right. Um, he hasn't gone on to challenge for, for another pride because if he doesn't challenge for another pride. He can't survive by himself in the wild. Mm -hmm. And so the, the hero on his journey, this basic, the basic form of the monomyth is within the nature of all animals. Just as you found, as, as you observe with the mandala of the, the fish of Japan. Right. And so we can, we can pull that down now. But so as a concept, I believe that the so-called collective unconscious is partly biological in nature and that doesn't require a DNA memory. And that's so in the case of lions, as we can see, we have, a, we have a hero and we have a stranger. And then we're, we, can, um, we can say that the, you know, the, the older lion perhaps mentors the younger lion mm -hmm. or, or another lion, the pack, maybe an, an older juvenile might mentor the, the, the other lion. And that becomes uh, the spiritual helper, okay? The difference between us and lions is that we tell the story. We share the story. We make the story more interesting. Wow. I just explained to you half the, half of the lion can <clears throat> move. <laughs> okay. yeah, sure. <laughs> but, but, but the difference with us and lions is they can't express it in the way that we do. They can't, they can't have that myth. And because they can't have the myth, they can't build on the myth. They can't, when they go from from point A to point B, they can't tell other lions at that new destination what happened at the first point. They can't build. They, the yeah, they live it though, they live it. They live it. Yeah. And so, so what is the collective unconscious? I believe similar, probably similar to Jung, is that it is biological within us. And that we, as humans, and perhaps we have a more elaborate imagination than the lions, and we perhaps have more um, complex dreams than the lions, um, because you, you've had cats and you've had dogs, and you, you know they dream, okay? Um, right. Sometimes you'll meet people who've never had a cat and a dog, and they'll say, of course they don't dream, like, you, you've seen it. Yeah. So, so, lions, so I'm, I'm pretty sure that lions dream, but lions no perhaps have the complex dreams, and they don't have the, the, the <clears throat> dreams that are of a greater, breath of characters that we have but the lion the lion at the top of that heap he knows for sure that that's the the juvenile at the bottom he recognizes that he, yeah well the puffer fish certainly knows how to make a mandala and they perfect and it knows how to make and, that mandala and it's perfect and so so when i express this story the hero's journey the the character goes from the north of spain to the, the african back again mm -hmm. i'm looking at it not just as this, this, this archetypal journey in, the, in our minds that we tell, but rather it's the same story of the lion that goes on his journey. We just take a longer journey and we're helped by the animals along, along the way. Right. Um, in, in the case of the, the pelvic cave image, you'll, you'll, the viewers will have seen that the, the dolphin lifts up the hero. A fascinating image 34,000 years ago. Sure. Um, and many other characters that, that that are helped out. So how, how does that, Skip, how does that feel to you as this being partly bioche biochemical as the basic route that we can then carry on to modern day myths? Well, it certainly applies to uh, what I was saying about the two million year old man. Correct. And, and how 
um, you know, all these creatures uh, going back billions of years now um, have learned all these things long, 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 long before we're even thinking about it. And, and so when, when you say what I said was scientific heresy, <laughs> uh, you know, that's all well and good, but, I, but in a sense, science is heresy to me. <laughs> uh, because because uh, what do scientists do, what they want to do, mm -hmm. they, they want to solve for X. So they mm -hmm. hold all the variables constant. Mm -hmm. and, and so they solve for X, holding all variables constant. And what Dr. Jung's work was about and what, what collective unconscious is about is about all the variables. Mm -hmm, so, so if you if you're going to do that, then you you can't even look at the psyche, mm -hmm. and and that's a completely really unexplored area of the all species, but human beings especially. But you know what what you've been saying and what. I've also shown here is that there are things that go back way before the human species. Correct. And, and these are images that are, um, that are in us. And, you know, and I'm, I'm a, I'm an absolute testimonial to the, to the dinosaur story because mm -hmm. it happened to me. It was a numinous dream that I had when I was six years old. And I still remember it like it was happening right now. So let's talk about transcendence now, the bird okay. man. Okay? okay. So we're going we're gonna to take this sort of up a level from the basic, the, the basic biochemistry of the lion as related to the human and look at why do we think we can transcend through the bird? Well, as I said earlier, when you interact with Native Americans, you come up with a different perspective about everything. <laughs> okay? uh -huh. yeah. I interacted with a Native American person who, was, who would be considered a shaman, but they don't use that word. And this person can trace his lineage of so-called shamans back for hundreds of years um, in the same right. tradition. Okay, and, and the, the bird man is one of the images you gave me because I, I have uh, Jonah's, Jonah revisited. I have so Kashi. transcendence is the bird man. Okay, I, I don't have a video on that. Okay, transcendence is the bird man. And, um, it was one of the early videos. Transcendence. When did we first experience transcendence? Native Americans transcended via the bird since time immemorial. Among Abrahamic religions, this medium is the angel Gabriel. In Hindu and Buddhist mythology, the being is Garuda. Ancient Egyptians worshipped the transcendent falcon man, Horus. To the ancient Babylonians, the avianoid was Ishtar. We find transcendence in a birdman at the French Lascaux cave 17,000 years ago. As a vulture spiritualist in the French Grotte de Pernampère cave from 25,000 years ago, Pablo Picasso refound this avianoid in the mythic imagination. We transcended through the bird mask 34,000 years ago at the Spanish cave of El Castillo. Again in El Castillo where the eagle-masked man holds an egg. Is transcendence in our collective unconscious? Before Orion. It certainly, it, it certainly applies to Egyptian myth because in, of course. In a, yeah, in Egyptian myth, you have bird men mm -hmm. in, in the imagery in the, in the tombs. Exactly. Yeah. So in my connection with this so-called Native American shaman, he told me that they, they capture eagles, which is mm -hmm. illegal, I'll let you know that it's illegal, mm -hmm. uh, even for the tribes. And they, they have a way that they can capture them and they pull out a feather. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that the feather symbolizes great heights that one can travel. 
because the eagle to the Native Americans is, at least in the Pacific Northwest, is one of the highest flying birds. Mm -hmm. And among the birds that we find the Pelican cave images that the, the, the man tra um, transcends and or transforms into, mm -hmm. they're entirely raptors. Okay? Sure. If you look at Horus, Horus, of course, is the, the eagle as well. And if you go around the world, in shamanic, so-called shamanic traditions, you find the same phenomena. People sure. generally don't take a pigeon a feather and put it in their head. They do. <laughs> But not in maybe shamanic if Maybe if you're a little kid, but. <laughs> okay. So in the Native American tradition that it is the highest flying bird, therefore, if you're gonna transcend into the great beyond, you need to be on that high flying bird. Mm -hmm. Now, I believe that birds don't have the idea that they're transcending to the great beyond. And so there's at some stage that we drew, we started to harness or take in the strengths of the birds, these raptors, to help us achieve transcendence to go into the great beyond. Sure. So we took a step above the lion of this biochemistry that we began to dream about going into the great beyond. And there's a, we, you mentioned the, the Egyptian, ancient Egypt, but Horus is in the, the Saqqara tombs, there's um, hundreds of thousands of bird raptors, typically mm -hmm. some sort of eagle or that is, then mummified that people would have an offering to help them to go into the great beyond and beyond their, in their death. Mm -hmm. um, and so you, you had to have a lot of bird farms to be able to do that one. Um, <laughs> I suppose so. Yeah. <laughs> but, he, but back to the concept is, so at some point, and it was at least 34,000 years ago, because we do have multiple characters transforming themselves into these raptor birds. And they're not just eagles, um, they could also be a kite which is a small raptor, as well as vultures. Mm -hmm. Vultures is actually a common theme. Yeah. Um, and they're bearded vultures. Um, and uh, so we, we've taken this a further step now into going to the great beyond um, and in a conscious way that we can, we can so dream. Now there's another archetypal character or it, let's say uh, an inorganic archetypal character we find that is the mountain. Oh, yes. It's about, and you have the video of the Cosmic Mountain. Yeah. Okay. The Cosmic Mountain. A Cosmic Mountain archetype appears in many of our greatest epics. This mountain calls to us in our dreams. We scale the peaks at great peril with no tangible reward. Hercules ascended Jebel Tobacal in North Africa, where the Titan Atlas held up the sky. Moses received the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. Jesus was transfigured on Mount Tabor. The Hindu Shiva sits on the Golden Mountain, Meru. Among Tibetans, Mount Everest is revered as an abode of the gods. Uluru is the sacred mountain to Aboriginal people in Australia. The Paleolithic hero on the Gallery of Discs is depicted in the conical-shaped Monte Castillo. We built mountains of faith where none exists to mimic those we found sacred. Rebuilding those temples on distant continents. On our inner journey to touch the sky. Before Orion. And that's an interesting one because in the young found in the dreams of all these all the people he personally um, encountered or that he surveyed through other analysts was that the two most common inorganic characters are the, the, ri the river of dream, transcend a body of water, transcendent body of water, mm -hmm. or, or, or renewing body of water, and the mountain. Right. And when you were a kid, if you were asked to draw a, a landscape scene, you probably drew a mountain. Okay? <laughs> you probably <laughs> drew a lake or a river. Um, sure. And uh, in, the, in this, there's a great song by Billy Joel. Mm -hmm. and 
Billy Joe was, was my generation. Um, and it was called the, the River of Dreams. And Billy Joe wakes up in the morning. He has a song in his head about um, tr- his fear of crossing the river. And on the other side of the river are these, 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 these mountains of faith. And, he, and he's not a, a spiritual man, and he was afraid to discuss this. But he ultimately just has said, I can't get this out of my head. I have to put it to tune and make the song. It became one of his most popular songs. Years later, there's an interview. Someone asked Billy Joe, what's the meaning of the, the mountain and of the river? So, Skip, you're going to analyze Billy Joel right now. Let's go for it. What, pardon? So, Billy Joel... Was, uh, Billy Joe was asked the question, well, what was the meaning of the mountain mm-hmm. and the river in, in your dream? The river you, was, you, you were afraid to cross and the mountain that was too high, high to climb. Well, um, the water is always the unconscious and, and um, you know, a, a mountain would be an, an obstacle among other things. I mean, it can be lots of things, but... It can be, sure. And so in mythology and in religions on the world, people are bathed in the water where Mm -hmm. they're transformed. They're reborn. Sure. And the the shaman or the hero throughout myths climbs this mountain, the so-called cosmic mountain, where he connects with the great beyond. Right. Um, Which, if I can take it back to Jungian psychology again, that's the ego separating itself from the the self from the two men very much so absolutely well, when, when he reaches men. the top of the mountain the ego are separate from the self because he's achieved that journey well true but that, then you get you get the global um, then you get the global understanding uh, the, which you know once you you know the question is do you believe in God? And mm-hmm. Jung says, I have no need to believe because I know. Mm-hmm. And, and so the, that part, the ego part, the ego can never know God, okay? The, the ego can get as close as they can possibly get, and every religious tradition does this by writing down all these uh, formulae for how you get to God, right? But in the end, you have to experience God. And once you've experienced God, then, then you can transcend, then you can fly away, mm-hmm. right? In, these, in the Pelican Cave images, we find these mountains. Uh-huh. And they're always the tallest mountains in their region. Right. Um, and those are the mountains that the, the hero climbs. Right. And if you go around the world, people... <clears throat> have these myths um, in all religions. I remember about 15, 20 years ago, I was on an airplane and I was flying coach as I always do. And there was a fellow next to me, a shamanic practitioner, and he was tell, telling me this for the first time because I had never heard of this. Mm-hmm. And he said that he, he and other shamans were, were comparing notes to try to find that original cosmic mountain. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I Googled okay. it a few years, maybe two, three years ago, I couldn't find anything about that. But as a concept, the question among these shamanic practitioners was, why do we all seek this mountain and to climb this mountain and that we're drawn to it? And is, was there an original cosmic mountain? So he, this goes back to Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell said there was this original monomyth. And we could say that, you know, our, the, the biochemistry of the, the, the hero and, and the stranger can go back to the lions. We can tell yeah. that's well, I, I mean, from a Jungian point of view, I would say that the cosmic mountain um, is in the psyche. It's not in the physical world. Correct. And, and, and so if you're going to climb that mountain, you have to look for it within. You can't look for it in the physical world. And so as, as far as so we know, it's transcendent. Correct. It's tra- okay, go ahead. So as far as we know, chimps don't climb mountains. Okay, other than yeah. if they live in the mountain. And chimps don't swim very well either. Right. <laughs> right. So they're not crossing the river, the river either, you know, to be reborn. Well, they know, they, they know that there's uh, crocodiles there. Yeah. So we have, at some point, so we're, we have a common ancestor between us and the chimpanzee. Yeah, as a sure. Program. So there, at some point, there was a split 
between the chimpanzee that we started to develop these higher, I don't want to say higher consciousness because I, that I couldn't make that mandrel that fish does underwater. Okay, so I'm not going to say that any, we're any smart or anything like that. But we developed this more intricate co consciousness that I believe goes back to a point that someone did originally climb this cosmic mountain. Um. That was an original myth of this. So someone originally had to, there had to be a first, if chimpanzees do it, someone, somewhere along the line, someone climbed that, that cosmic mountain. Uh, well, there had to be a well, first. We, we all do, but, but from a Jungian psychology point of view, the, the hero's journey is the journey uh, away from the Oedipus complex. In other mm -hmm. words, it's, it's not Peter Pan. Peter mm -hmm. Pan is is stuck in the Oedipus situation, mm -hmm. and if you're in order, the hero has to separate himself from the unconscious, mm -hmm. and uh, and so he has to climb this cosmic mountain, which is getting out of the unconscious mm -hmm. and into the physical world. Uh, that's the cosmic mountain, but it's but because people didn't differentiate until even 150 years ago, until the time of Freud or a little bit before, um, they didn't understand that this journey was taking place in the in the psyche instead of mm -hmm. in the physical world. So they were looking for something in the physical world that was never there, the cosmic mountain. So there, there was at some point in the existence of humans, homo sapiens, or what, what whatever preceded us, mm -hmm. we gain the sense of, trans, of the river transformation and climb the cosmic mountain. Right. And those are two characters we also find in this myth. Right. So the, in, in the Pell at the Cave image, the guy, character, he swims across the Strait of Gibraltar. Yeah. Also aided by a <clears throat> aided by a dolphin and, and by a whale, and so we there was some point in our past that we we mentally transformed that were different from a chimpanzee. Mm -hmm. So what what might have dro driven that? Was it just um, you know this would be like a great case of God? I'm going to tell you right now that um, religious. Well, I, I mean we're problem solving creatures, and so are all creatures. Okay, and so. We're in order, you know, people think that once you get your degree, mm -hmm. then you're through and, and then life is hunky dory after that, but it's not. When you're finished your degree, you've learned how to solve a few problems, but you have problems all your life. You can't get away from them. And, and so when you run into a problem that you hadn't anticipated, you end up gaining consciousness, mm -hmm. right? Because you, because it's a it's a problem that you didn't expect that you didn't know would happen. Okay, so for a chimp, it would have been, um, you know, they're living somewhere they they haven't run into a certain species that's deadly, probably a snake, and and so um, you know, a few chimps get killed by snakes. Now we know about snakes, right? Mm. And now we have consciousness of s snakes. Mm. And, and so that's how consciousness comes, is problem solving. Mm -hmm. you, have, you have a new problem, and now you're going to solve your problem. And I'm good with that. Okay. I'm, I, I'm good with that in terms of the snakes. But climbing a mountain is something you do outside of something that attacks you or something you need to feed because you don't you don't climb you don't climb a mountain for food um it's at great peril it's it goes it goes beyond so here's an here's an idea here's a possibility and i'm not in the god camp just to let you know but it, okay well, that yeah. would have been a good case for god but i'm not in the god camp and um, earlier i expressed that lions can't tell their myth story even though they do if they do express this myth in their right. lives. Yeah. Sure. We tell the story. And so at some distant point now past, it could have been hundreds of thousands, it could be millions of years ago, when we developed the concept of speech, that we express this story of climbing the mountain. And it became natural 
as part of this, this, this original tribe of people that we climbed the mountain as the apprentice had to climb the mountain as part of the journey. Well, the mountain was a symbol of, of uh, an obstacle that was overcome. Exactly. And so it goes back to Joseph Campbell. He said there was original monomyth. Maybe there wasn't an original monomyth story, but perhaps there was an original mon place of the monomyth that we actually experienced what we then went on to continue to strive for and dream. That there was an original dream. that we developed through the con through our own our own journey own hero's journey through life a very very long time ago okay I mean, and that's how it landed in our in our psyche sure yeah correct and so if we go back 34000 heresy right <laughs> the, oh this is complete sign to the heresy <laughs> exactly right. the knight's journey in the middle of the night, we are haunted by a journey across water that emerges from our psyches. This archetypal night's journey is widely evoked in myth, art, and song. The ancient Egyptians believed that the sun god Ra traveled on a boat through the underworld at night. The Greeks held that the river Styx formed a boundary between Hades and the world of the living. Some Native American dreamers crossed the Milky Way to the other side. A hero pictured in Spain's El Castillo Cave from 34,000 years ago swims across a mystical water in the night. The night's crossing was told in the rhyme of the ancient mariner. In the middle of the night, the piano man tried crossing the river to find what he was looking for. But the river was so wide and deep and too hard to cross. Since time immemorial, we have been looking for something. Something sacred we lost. On that journey across water in the middle of the night. Before Orion. Okay, so to pull this all together. Okay. Um, I believe that there is a collective unconscious that that collective unconscious is, is, is not instinct. Um, I believe it's based fundamentally based at the animal level on biochemistry. And as we evolved or we changed as human beings from the common ancestors with the chimpanzee, we developed more elaborate stories. And as we travel around the world, we carried those stories with us. And we took those original dreams and we took those myths and they become part, they became part of our unconscious. And that's fundamentally what separates us from the other animals. As far as we know, that don't climb cosmic mountains that don't transcend through birds. Um, oh, I mean, you know, I acknowledge that these things um, come through biology, mm -hmm. okay, somehow. We don't know how, sure. okay, and there, and there are a lot of PhD theses waiting to be written on this topic. Uh, however, uh, I, I don't concur with your um, characterization of the collective unconscious, not mm -hmm. at all, mm -hmm. um, because, um, what you're talking about is actually archetypes, okay? And, um, and so archetypes in the collective unconscious um, are two different things mm -hmm. somewhat, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so an archetype is there's a pattern and that pattern is like a riverbed and that river, uh, it's like a, a phonograph in in your jukebox or a, a record in your jukebox. Once you start it playing, you can't stop it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it plays through. So uh, the most familiar archetype would be mother. Mm -hmm. um, once a woman becomes a mother, uh, she's going to be a mother for the rest of her life. Mm -hmm. And she cannot escape that. Never. Okay. Uh, the 
the archetype that men run into at that stage is warrior. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't mean being a military man. It means, um, it, it may mean the hero's journey mm -hmm. quite simply, but mm -hmm. it, it, you know, it means attaining maturity and being able to break a wreck break away from mama's home right so um so the the warrior has to ha has to become a mature man somehow okay sure. that that's the hero's journey actually um and um and so so once once there's water in that riverbed um, it's going to play through all the way. It doesn't stop until it's done. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you can have little archetypes and big archetypes and mother and father, are a couple of them, um, that are big ones, but they're also little ones. Mm -hmm. And, um, but that is somewhat different from the collective unconscious. Mm -hmm. let, let me suffice it to say that at this point and um you know the collective unconscious is something that's really unconscious but it um you know it, what makes what makes you and me an american okay and very simply okay we have if we go into our uh, televisions right now we'll see cable news uh showing certain things on TV and, and people suggesting that we're all divided up and we, we don't agree with one another, for mm -hmm. example. Okay. I mean, the, the divisiveness of our country is, is uh, a rampant story right mm -hmm. now. But if you go to your local grocery store uh, or anywhere in Portland, uh, you will see that, things work pretty well, mm -hmm. okay? And they work pretty well regardless of race, national origin, or, um, or religion, or ethnic group, right? And they pretty much work the same. And, uh, you know, if you and I did a, maybe a, a 500 question survey about what it means to be an American, probably we would agree 95% at least. Mm -hmm. okay? But that would also be true of my uh, Korean American son-in-law. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> it wouldn't be any different with him. Mm -hmm. And, and so, uh, and we didn't get that because we studied it in school. Mm -hmm. It came to us unconsciously mm -hmm. and it came to us Across the country mm -hmm. unconsciously mm -hmm. um, and it comes to everyone who comes to live here within um, you know within a generation clearly but um, in most cases I would say uh, in, in less than a generation within a year or two mm -hmm. people who immigrate into the United States become American mm -hmm. okay and um, you know it's like becoming a Marine, I can never tell you what it means to me or to any other Marine to be a Marine. Mm -hmm. Okay. I can tell you all the, all the rituals I went through and all the stuff I had to do, but I can never convey to you what it means to be a Marine. That's unconscious, but every Marine knows. Okay. And so I would happily go into a trench with any Marine today, okay? Now, um, Neil deGrasse Tyson poo-poos this, but one time he was talking about the first time he visited Carl Sagan's office and the moment that he was looking at the door of Carl Sagan's office and it said Carl Sagan and he was talking about the emotions that ran through his mind, there is no way that in a logos kind of way, in a rational scientific way, he could write down what that moment meant to him. Never. He could never do it. Um, and that 
was entirely unconscious. Okay. <laughs> and so what it means to him is entirely unconscious and he could never convey it is my point. And so you and I could sit here and talk for hours about what it means to be American and, and never settle on the, a final definition. Okay. There's a, there's a, a philosophy professor in uh, Toronto called uh, John Dravakey, and he's just done uh, 50 videos on the meaning crisis, so called. And so he's sliced and diced meaning through philosophy since the beginning of time or the beginning of written records. And uh, he entirely has missed the point because the meaning that he wants to be talking about is the meaning of your life or the meaning of my life. Okay. But he's trying to define that. And if you can't define it and I can't define it, but we know it has meaning, <laughs> then how can a philosophy professor in Toronto give me uh, a meaning of my life based on philosophers. He cannot, okay? It's, he's trying to do a logos thing, which is a, a definition. He wants to give a dictionary definition of meaning, and it's not about that. It's about my life. It's not about what you could write in a dictionary about meaning. It's about my life, and I can never convey that, okay? <laughs> I just gave a couple of simple examples of how that couldn't be conveyed. But if you took all the, all the uh, slices that it could be, you, you can never touch it. And so, um, so the collective unconscious is about that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's not in the logos side of the, the, ledger it's in the arrows side of the ledger and um and so uh, we've come a long way today in this last hour trying to figure out how we got there didn't we yeah so anyway um i'm 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 happy to continue the conversation but i i have a a hard you got dinner that my wife has uh yeah is pretty tough about it. okay fair so let's do let's do this so we'll, we'll close it now let's do a close 